you. Another successful quest. Boy, stealing dirty socks from peasants is exhausting. Time to go take a nice hot bath after a job well done. What? What? This is Magic Maker and it's amazing and I'm gonna talk about it because there's a lot to talk about here. First off a little warning, I'm gonna spoil some stuff here. I'll try to spoil as little mechanical stuff as possible because experimenting with the magic system is the entire point of the game, but I will talk about the entire main plot. I don't think spoiling it will seriously diminish anybody's enjoyment of the game, but I'll definitely warn you before I go into that stuff, in case you really care. Here's the abbreviated history of Magic Maker. Magic Maker is a 2014 computer game developed and published by US indie game development company Tasty Studios. Probably a hot contender for the best company name ever. It is a 2D side-scrolling action platformer with procedurally generated levels. The core feature is a customization system that allows players to design magic spells. Tasty Studios were founded in 2011 by Chris Lado D. Hutchinson, Nick Woe Constrictor Pavo, Splee Linka, and Paul Mavenstar Witt. Development on a game called Generator Quest began the same year, likely before the founding of the company. Generator Quest was a 3D top down shooter. Eventually, the concept was reworked into a 2D action platformer and renamed to Magic Maker. In March 2012, Magic Maker was opened up for free alpha testing. In August 2012, the Steam Greenlight platform was launched and Magic Maker was added to Greenlight the same month. The public alpha continued all the way until the game's official release in September 2014. October 2014 saw an update that added a special Halloween mission and in December 2014 a new Game Plus feature was added to the game. Magic Maker has received numerous smaller updates mostly for bug fixes, balancing issues and quality of life improvements since then. The game begins with a nameless protagonist standing in a town that looks like it was hit hard by some kind of horrible recession. All the shops and businesses are closing down, everybody is unemployed. With no other option available, you hit up the local wizard temp agency, where you are assigned a job as a security guard at Durwall Community College, a school for magic, to replace their former guard. You are then immediately teleported to a training and testing course. This is of course the game's tutorial. It's fairly short and teaches the mechanics in a pretty effective learning by doing way. You are introduced to how to create and use wands and magic spells by being presented with obstacles that can only be removed by combining the available tools and magical materials. For example, to get through here, you need to hit a target through a wall with your wand. You are given the rock material, which allows projectiles to pass through walls up to a certain maximum distance. You use that on your wand and there you go, you can now hit the target and proceed. You also learn how the platforming controls work and yeah, here's the first problem the game has. The platforming is the weakest link here. It just feels terrible. It's incredibly easy to constantly fall off ledges and have to work your way back up and the game loves to knock you about with spell recoil or enemy attacks and it can get incredibly tedious just maneuvering through the levels sometimes. It's a fortunate thing that you can eventually skip all that, more on that later. The game then introduces gems. Four optional gems can be found in every level. Each gem immediately heals you by your maximum HP, restores all your mana and unlocks a chest at the end of the level. 
collecting all four opens a special chest. In addition to end of level chests, you can find chests within levels as well. Chests contain materials. Enemies can sometimes drop materials. You use materials to customize your equipment. Simple. At the end of the <coughs> At the end of the tutorial, you fight a plant monster and then advance through a treasure portal to cash in your gems. You are then given your security guard license and a chance to futz around with spell design before being sent on your first mission. The headmaster of Durwall College sends you to the forest zone to investigate suspicious activity and establishes that he is fantasy racist against goblins who are, according to him, too dumb to cast spells. But people have reported spell casting goblins in the forest, so you're gonna check out what's going on. He also reveals the previous security guard didn't live very long. As you can probably see, the game doesn't take itself very seriously at all. The setting is mostly defined by everything being pretty awful, everybody being completely incompetent and or immoral, and everything is generally presented as pretty wacky. So you run around a procedurally generated forest area, shooting magic at monsters, collecting materials and searching for gems, when you run into this green-haired lady who introduces herself as Azazel. She then decides she probably shouldn't have done that and tells the goblins she's been teaching magic to kill you and disappears. You kill the goblins and with your main objective met, you head to the boss area. Every level ends with a boss that has to be defeated to finish the level. This entire first mission is pretty easy. It's perfectly doable even if you didn't assign any materials to your slots. Which is good because the chances for a beginner at the game creating some weak or even downright useless spells is pretty high. One boss later, the portal opens and you claim your rewards. The big 4 gem chest in this case contains Jani's Socks of Jumping, your first artifact which makes reaching high places a lot less annoying, thankfully. The headmaster tells you that he apparently fired Azazel for complaining about Durwall College's no monsters policy. And then you finally arrive at Durwall College itself. This is the game's hub, where you can experiment with your spell crafting, talk to various wacky NPCs, change what you and your spells look like and choose missions to go on. I'll go into spellcrafting later in greater detail, so let's focus on the other stuff first. The NPCs all have things to say, but it's pretty much endless jokes, exposition about how terrible the world is, how incompetent and immoral everybody is, and so on and so on. It gets a bit tiring, honestly, but you can just not talk to people, so it doesn't really matter much. The cosmetic character customization in this game is actually pretty great. You can change the shape of various body parts and add clothes and accessories in any color you like. I decided to be a pastel goth lich queen, because why the hell not? Five portals on campus take you to five different zones. This is where you go on missions. Missions come in four difficulty levels with easy missions unlocking harder ones. In harder missions, enemies deal more damage and have more HP, but the materials you discover are generally of higher quality as well. Every zone has a different kind of boss and every mission ends with you fighting a procedurally generated boss assembled from various parts and given a random name. For example, every boss in the desert zone is a sandworm with three phases. How the sandworm fights during a given phase depends on what body parts it has. So you can predict how it will act if you know what each body part does just by looking at it. It's pretty neat. Further, each zone has some special rewards. They can be unlocked by opening four gem chests. These rewards can be new artifacts like Jani socks or special items that improve your spellcasting ability. All in all, you can gain an additional slot each for your wand, your spells and your robe as well as one additional spell slot, allowing you to have two spells to switch between. These are always the first special rewards you get in their respective zones. Missions, once successfully finished, cannot be replayed, but finishing them allows you access to free play of the given difficulty, 
where the only task is to kill the boss. So you can't lock yourself out of those special rewards even if you fail to find all gems at some point. And that's basically it. That's how the game works. Now let's talk magic. All magic in the game uses materials which are put in slots. There are 45 different materials in the game and each one comes in 5 grades labeled A, B, C, D and F. The higher the grade, the stronger the material's effects. What exactly a material does depends on whether you use it in a wand, spell or robe. The order in which materials are slotted into your equipment doesn't matter, but using multiples of a material will generally strengthen the material's effect. Material effects on your robe are generally passive or reactive effects that don't really interact with each other. No matter what other stuff you have in your robe, using a quicksilver gear in it increases your movement speed, for example. Using higher grade or multiple gears, or both, results in a stronger increase of your movement speed. And other effects work similarly. Guillotines raise your max HP, Actoplasm raises your max MP. Rock causes you to create a shockwave whenever you hit the ground. Fairy Dust allows you to double cast a spell every few castings. There's a lot of stuff and choosing the right materials for your robe can make the difference between life and death. Wands and spells work very similarly to each other, with the difference being that wands do absolute piss for damage and spells cost mana per use. So you can always use your wand, but if you run out of mana, you cannot cast any spells until you regain some. I just... I just want to gush so hard about all the intricacies, but I don't want to spoil too much, as this stuff is best if you explore it yourself. The possibilities here are freaking endless and materials do often affect each other in really interesting ways. I can spend extended periods of time just experimenting with different combinations and seeing what works and what doesn't. It's amazing! Okay, I'll give one simple example. A complete default spell with no materials fires exactly one projectile that deals 100 damage to whatever enemy is hit by it. If we add fairy dust to it, we get a spell that fires multiple projectiles but also reduces the damage per projectile. So now we have a spell that is easier to hit with and that can hit multiple enemies at once, but that also deals reduced damage to those enemies. If we now add a crystal ball material to it, the spell's projectiles become homing projectiles, meaning they change direction instead of flying straight outward. This allows us to hit the same enemy with multiple projectiles which deals quite a bit more damage than the default spell would. In short, a lot of materials have both advantages and disadvantages and using other materials to circumvent those disadvantages is the first basic step to effective spell design. Some materials are a bit more esoteric. Rift crystals cause a spell to also teleport you forward a short distance with every casting. This is, by the way, what I meant when I said you can skip the platforming in the game eventually. The rune material inflicts enemies with a status effect that causes them to drop mana crystals when killed. You can collect these mana crystals to replenish your mana. There's tons to see and play with here. Finally, you can mark a spell as an enchantment. Enchantments don't deal direct damage on a hit, but various other effects are strengthened and the teleport distance of rift crystals is increased. You begin with three slots each in your wand, your one spell and your robe. As previously mentioned, you can unlock a second spell and an additional slot for all your gear. Four slots give you a lot to work with, but it never feels like it's enough. You always feel like you could make your design that much more useful if you just had one more slot. Well, here's the good news. You can get a second additional slot in New Game Plus. New Game Plus, or NG Plus, is a feature some games have where after beating the game, you can restart from the beginning while keeping some of your progress. Often the game's difficulty is also increased in the process. In Magic Maker NG Plus, you keep all your artifacts and materials and you can re-earn the items that give extra slots to your gear which means you can get a total of 5 slots now. Enemies get tougher and deal more damage to sort of make up for that. And after that, 
you start NG++ and then NG++. You can get up to 7 slots this way. And just so you can see what kind of difference that makes, this is what the game looks like on a new game. And this is what it looks like on NG++. It's almost a completely different game and that's amazing! Here's the bad news. Even 7 slots are unsatisfying because you always feel like you could improve upon it with just one more slot. At least for me that feeling never went away. But regardless, 7 slots gives you a lot to work with and I found myself spending extended periods of time not even doing missions but experimenting with spell design at the hub. I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about customization systems again. As I previously mentioned in my first video, customization systems are a favorite of mine and I got thoughts. So here we go. A tricky subject in general, but especially where customization systems are concerned, is balance. Some people will tell you that balance is always super important and that everything needs to be as balanced as possible at all times, but that's not entirely true. Certainly, some games, especially PvP multiplayer games, do often require certain things to be as balanced as possible. Any underpowered hero in a game like Overwatch and any subpar fighter in a fighting game is unlikely to be played by a lot of people. And what's the point of having something in the game if nobody uses it? Obviously, the meta game plays into that as well, but let's not get into that right now. But it is important to note that strong balancing is not a universally good thing. There are in fact games that would suffer from strict adherence to balancing. Unbalanced game elements offer various opportunities for game design. They can, for example, be used to allow players to set a desired difficulty or challenge level without resorting to one of these horrible things right here. Dark Souls is known for being challenging, but it is also, on top of that, just unbalanced enough to allow the savvy player to make the game a lot easier on themselves by picking different options for their character build. Sorcery and Pyromancy are well known in the community to make the game a lot easier. A dex build allows the use of bows to selectively aggro enemies or simply kill them from afar, and if you have the patience and know-how, you can totally use them to kill the toughest boss in the game without having to actually fight him. I personally like to play Dark Souls with minimal armor and a huge sword in melee, but that's definitely not the easiest way to play. If you ever bounced off of Dark Souls due to the difficulty, maybe give it another shot with a Pyromancer next time. There is no shame in using what the game offers to get the experience you want. So does that mean that non-PvP games are best with as little balance as possible? Well, no. A uh, limiting factor here is challenge. Part of the fun of most games, at least most games with the skill or strategy component, lies in overcoming adversity and challenging situations. Make a game too easy and it may become boring despite being otherwise well made. Make the game too hard and it becomes frustrating, which is not something everybody likes. Yeah, like me. I don't like being frustrated and I frustrate easy. Leave me alone, Bennett Foddy. An orange is sweet, juicy fruit locked inside a bitter peel. That's not how I feel about a challenge. I only want the bitterness. It's coffee. It's grapefruit. It's licorice. Hey. Hey, Bennett. You know what those things have in common? They're all fucking disgusting, don't at me. Disclaimer, they're getting over it. Bennett 40 is a fine game, it's just not for me. An unbalanced game runs the risk of being, at the same time, too hard and too easy. It takes some really stellar game mechanical engineering to get players to purposefully handicap themselves to tweak the challenge to their personal optimal level. So you need a sensible balance between balanced and unbalanced. I wrote that. Well, you know what I'm trying to say. 
Okay, let's look at balance in customization systems. By this I mean stuff like role-playing games where you can level different stats or abilities and combine them with items to create discrete character builds. But also stuff like crafting systems a la Mercenary Kings and, well, Magic Maker. Finding that delicate balance between balance and imbalance is probably one of the most important considerations to make here. A significant part of the fun in games like these is attaining system mastery, the skill to cleverly combine game elements to create effective builds. But for this to work, there needs to be a difference between a good build and a bad build. The possibility of making poor choices needs to be designed for. It needs to be built into the game for system mastery to mean anything. If you could just take your build and swap out any one element with a random other one and end up with a build of equivalent utility and effectiveness, then your choices don't matter as much. You can just throw anything together and it'll work. Boring. In contrast, there's a very special kind of joy in finding a build, a combination or a recipe that's stronger than average, or even just stronger than your last one. Improving on something and finding it to be tangibly better afterwards is just really incredible. And it can only happen if it's possible to make a bad thing to then improve upon. So ideally the customization mechanics in these games should be designed to be balanced enough to allow for even masterful players to be challenged, but unbalanced enough for system mastery to affect performance. So, where does Magic Maker fall on this scale? Well, about here. And I'm strangely okay with that. Okay, I know that kinda goes against half of what I just talked about, but hear me out. Magic Maker's spellcraft system is so robust and gives so many options that the game is fun even if you completely ruin the challenge. About halfway through my first playthrough, I had stumbled upon certain combinations that turned the game into a cakewalk. I was just strolling through even the most difficult levels, completely annihilating all opposition with little difficulty. And it was so much fun! It's a power trip, I admit it, just complete and utter power fantasy shit, but it was exhilarating and it remained fun for several playthroughs, which incidentally became shorter and shorter because the game does not scale nearly on par with how much more powerful you can get. So yeah, I love it, even though it's extreme. But obviously there are also problems. It's easy to fall into a bit of a rut with a game where you have identified the strongest spell combination available to you and then just use that forever. Why experiment with new stuff if what you have works? The game clearly wants to encourage experimentation in the player, but it fails by allowing the player to make spells that always, always work. The extreme lack of balance makes it impossible to design challenges that force players to change up their builds. Don't get me wrong, the different bosses are certainly more vulnerable to different strategies and builds, but what does it matter if there's even a single build that completely destroys all of them? So it's important that if you choose to play Magic Maker, you do what the game fails to do and motivate yourself to keep experimenting. Because that's where most of the fun is. And that's it, isn't it? No, of course it isn't. I haven't even spoiled the whole plot yet. Which I will do right now. So if you don't want to hear spoilers, please skip to whatever timestamp this is. Alright, so on several missions, you run into Azazel doing stuff. And sometimes ruining your shit. For example, by stealing a magical gem you're supposed to procure. Once you have done all the story missions, which are conveniently marked orange, a new portal opens in the Headmaster's office. There you can access the final story mission. The Headmaster explains that the end of your first month as a security guard is coming up and that means you're about to get paid. So he sends you on a totally not suicide mission. But before you can stupidly accept this obvious ploy to save money and get yourself killed, Azazel teleports in and saves you the hassle of going anywhere by blowing you the fuck up where you stand. What follows is, honestly, my favorite level in the game. Just 
Look at this. It's so very pretty in how minimal it is. Stark contrast, simple lines, all those neat particle effects. As you go, you find power-ups and your attacks keep getting stronger and more devastating as you essentially gain more materials which are immediately slotted into the one attack you have. You find a portal. It's time to go back. You have a job to do. And it takes you back to the world of the living. Here you find out that Azazel abducted the headmaster. You get another chance to get yourself kitted out and then it's off into Azazel's dark tower thing which turns out to be a magic school for monsters. This level is not procedurally generated and is full of goblin wizards and also puzzles that are easily completely bypassed by teleporting, which is good because this part looks like a pain in the ass. At the top of the tower, Azazel reveals that she transformed the headmaster into a goblin as punishment for his anti-goblin stance. Azazel then turns into a monster and you fight. And then the tower collapses and you fight some more on your way down. You hit the ground hard and some rubble crushes all your materials out of you as well as all of your bones and organs. Azazel is stuck in a tree and with only your unaugmented wand left to you, you shoot her until she falls and dies. Day is saved. The rest of the cast fall from above and land safely. Then you get crushed to death by more debris. Roll credits. Wow, holy shit what an ending. Okay, so much for the summary. Let's talk about the story and what it says. As previously established, you play a security guard working for Derwal Community College, which is a magic school that explicitly excludes monsters. Your boss, the headmaster, makes open racist remarks about goblins and would literally rather see you dead than pay you for all the work you do. And what is that work you do? Oh, you know, a whole bunch of good stuff like stealing magical lanterns, shooting ghosts for no sensible reason and setting fairies on fire. The main antagonist is Azazel, who is mainly characterized as someone who thinks monsters should be allowed to learn magic and succeeds at teaching monsters magic. You oppose her because you work for the school that refuses to teach monsters magic. Oh my god. I'm the asshole. It's me. Durwall is the anti-monster establishment. Azazel wants equality and believes in the mental capacities of monsters. You work for the establishment. Your boss is a racist. Your colleagues are all greedy, selfish wankers. You spend all your time killing just absolutely ridiculous amounts of monsters. But not only are you a willing tool of the murderous wizards, you're fucking dedicated too. When Azazel blows you up, understandable since you're the only competent one around, you literally come back from the dead to do your job. The job, I might add, you have never even been paid for doing. You're the biggest dope in history. You do the bidding of amoral shitheads for no pay whatsoever. They'd rather literally see you dead than even give you a fucking slice of the pie they hired you to protect. You're not one of them. You're just some working class guy looking for a paycheck you will never ever get. And yet, here you are going above and beyond to save them. Oh, but 
Uh, what about that whole thing where Azazel turns the headmaster into a goblin? Is that just reset to normal when she dies? Nope, the headmaster is still a goblin. Perhaps this changes his outlook on life. Perhaps Azazel's fight wasn't in vain after all. Well, fuck. So, what did I think of Magical Dipshit Cop Simulator 2014? I love it! I mean, this is probably no surprise, I kinda gave that away. Um, but how can you blame me? This game's fantastic! The gameplay is kinda wonky, some levels are absolute torture on the first run, looking at you, Temple Zone! But the core systems are so powerful I can easily see past all that. And what I had first thought to just be a nihilistic excuse plot is in the end surprisingly resonant. At least it resonated with me. It's not deep, it's not subtle, it's not even executed with any kind of finesse or particular cleverness, but it works. It's a farcical condemnation of blind obedience to authority and status quo and I'm fucking here for it. I have a bit of a problem with the framing of human-monster relations being analogous to race relations, but that's a topic for another video. By this point it should be clear to you that I'm angling to get people to give the game a try. Why else would I avoid going into mechanical spoilers so hard? So be aware of this and make sure you only get the game if you can easily afford it, or uh, after you've checked for a second opinion maybe. Uh, don't make financial decisions based on my opinions alone, I don't want that responsibility. <laughs> That's pretty much all I have to say on this today. Uh, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed it.